see you all bright, smiling faces this morning. I just want to share a little letter we got before we get started from uh, Nabisoto. This is, uh, this is from the school that John and Kimberly uh, oversee there in Nabisoto, Uganda. And every now and then we get a, a, one of the students writes us a letter. And so this one is kind of cute. They're all cute, but I wanted to share this one. My name is Ninsima, is that it? Juliet. I live in Nabasoto. I am in primary seven class. I am 12 years old. I am here with my brothers and sisters, are very fine, and am also doing well. At my school, I'm happy because I have time to rest. <laughs> That's what I thought was especially funny. They get to come to school and rest. <laughs> Can you explain just real quickly? I know what the answer is, but... Well, now she's in the dormitory. Ah, she's in the dormitory. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, because when they're not at school, then they're at home probably working... The crops and carrying the water and and uh, uh, so now she has time to rest. <laughs> um, I in my village, we rear. She says animals uh, like cows, goats, sheep, etc. Also, we grow crops like maize, sorghum, tea, rice, uh, rice, etc. My best subject is English and social studies. I want to be a nurse. My village, Nabasoto, is fine. <laughs> Let's pray for Ninsima, okay? And I want to pray for one other thing. Most of you that pay any attention to the news know that Israel was attacked this weekend by Iran. Uh, not... Uh, not ground troops, but missiles and um, drones. They sent, I don't know how many over, but many, many, many ones. And uh, fortunately, nobody was injured or, or killed. As far as we know, most of them were shot out of the air uh, before, they, before they got there or before they landed. And... Uh, so let, we want to pray for Israel. We want to pray, as, as the Bible says, for the peace of Jerusalem. So, Lord, we want to lift up, first of all, Ninsima and her family there in this little village in Navasoto. And we want, to, we want to just thank you, Lord, for the work that is happening there, the, the school that is going on even now that uh, John and Kimberly oversee there and have started and... I know it's, it is such a blessing to this little, this little village, Nabasoto. All these people there, Lord, and, and uh, they're all really poor. And they're just doing their best to eke out a living. And I thank you for the hope that this school provides for them. The hope that um, they, they don't have to stay uh, in that place of poverty. That they can, that they can learn and that they can become really whatever uh, they want to be and what you have called them to be, just, just through education and, and by uh, responding to the gospel and, and getting saved and, and uh, following after you. Lord, I thank you for this hope that they have, and I pray for this young girl that you will just touch her, and I pray, Lord, that you will help her to become whatever it is that you want her to be. If that's a nurse, then I pray that you'll help her to, to continue getting that education, to, to go on from uh, seventh class to, into high school and, to, and then to college and, and to get that education. So we pray for her and we pray for the, the many others that are there, Lord, that they would have the same kinds of dreams and, and make the same kind of commitment to you. And their families as well. So bless that, bless that work there, Father. Be with John and Kimberly and strengthen them for that work. 
And I pray that you'll provide the funds that are necessary to do the things that, that uh, need to be done to maintain the facility that's there and also to uh, build the new buildings that they want to build and start the new uh, learning center and the ministry there that, that takes place. So just be with them and help them in this. And then we also want to lift up the nation of Israel. We want to pray that your hand would be upon that nation and upon those leaders. We pray, Lord, that you'll uh, give them wisdom in knowing how to respond to these attacks. I know that uh, they've already responded um, in one way, uh, and I pray that you will uh, help them to be measured and help them to be wise uh, in doing what they need to do in order to uh, discourage this kind of thing in the future. We know, Lord, that your hand is on this nation, and we know that many of them, uh, indeed most of them, uh, don't know you, and they need to come to know you. And I pray that you'll use the believers that are there, the thousands of believers that are there, uh, to reach others with the gospel. And uh, I pray that uh, uh, there'll be a great revival there. So we thank you for that. Thank you for your protection. And I pray that you'll be with our leaders as well in uh, their resolve to continue to support Israel no matter what and uh, so that we can be a blessing to them. So bless our time together this morning, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And we pray that we will grow this morning in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name. And everybody agreed saying... Amen. You can all stand.
ashes step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope and came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the whirring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope god you are my living to walk in the room don't need our permission to do what you want to do you're already here we rest in your presence we just want you holy spirit welcome jesus have your way moment in your presence can change everything why we do tomorrow to lift these hands in faith right now our hearts are open don't leave us the Perfection. 
direction for your spirit to move. Don't need our religion or the things that we try to do. You're already with us. We rest in your presence. We just want you. So Holy Spirit, welcome. Jesus, have your way. One moment in your presence can change everything. Why wait for tomorrow to lift these hands in faith? But now our hearts are open to leave us this way. Forgive us for using your name for our gain, for building a kingdom, for building a brand, for seeking a platform, all castles of sand. It is our repentance, and Lord, we confess we have been prodigals, but we're coming back. Back to our first love, back to the Son, back to the Father, oh, back to your heart. Oh, it's been welcome, Jesus, have your way, a moment in your presence can change everything. So why wait for tomorrow to lift these hands in faith? chance to be together and worship this morning. Lord, we do ask your spirit join us wherever two or more are gathered, your word says, you're with us. And we thank you for that promise. And we thank you for that blessing. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless us this morning. Speak through Dan, help him to speak the words that we need to hear. Lord, we just ask that your spirit would fall on him and open our ears to the words we're about to hear. Lord, we do bless or ask for your blessing on this little church. And we praise you for a chance to be together this morning and worship you. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So I'm going to do announcements, but I don't have my bulletin with me. Just let me grab that real quick. Real quickly, I got to tell you, fantastic, fantastic chili feed Friday night. Thank you to all the participants who, uh, okay. Thank you for all the participants. It was fantastic and a hard choice. We have some very good cooks here in our midst, right? And we find that every time we do a breakfast, a potluck, uh, a chili cook-off or a barbecue cook-off. So keep them coming. Love the great food. Absolutely blessed by the fellowship to be able to meet with and interact with and learn some new things about our, our uh, fellow worshipers. So that's awesome. Emily Helgeson has a quick announcement she wants to pop up and tell us. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm up here to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming Ladies' Day Out. 
Uh, it's always been such a blessing, and I've shared in years past how it was my first event that I attended since moving to Cleelum that really made me feel like I knew I was at home. And I felt so comfortable with all the ladies, and I felt like God told me, like, like it was weird. I felt like he was like, you're going to have a baby shower with these ladies. You're going to have this with these ladies. And, then, and all these things have come to pass. It felt weird in the moment. But here, many years later, all these things have happened, and these ladies feel more like family today than, of course, they did was it 10, 11 years ago? So it's just amazing um, the impact that it can have on your life for fellowship, but just the deep concentration that we have on growing in the Lord is just amazing. And it's in, we're in such a day and age where we're always trying to accomplish more. It's nice to come and not have the distractions of dishes or laundry or an errand or this and that, but to come and dwell in God's presence. And it reminds us of the importance of needing to do that every day. Um, so I'm thankful so much for the speaker that we're going to have coming, as Debbie has shared. Someone's coming who does pottery while she teaches, which is amazing. I've never seen that, so I'm looking forward to it. But it's just um, a great day to come and grow in your faith, grow in fellowship. And we also have um, lunch and dinner provided so you don't have to plan those meals or do the dishes for those. Um, and then we have a really fun craft, and I've been asked to bring mine because those of us who are helping um, set things up have gotten a chance to do ours as samples. So this is, um, I framed mine, and this is some fused glass we get to do as a project. And you do not have to be artistic. I'm kind of crafty, like not like sneaky, but like crafts, you know. And um, I, but I am not, <laughs> well, I always feel like that's a confusing term. But um, I am not artistic, never have been. So um, this is a really fun craft to do. It's also available to us at um, a very much improved rate because I know we've had some donations and some people who have helped make this day possible for us. So um, if you've ever been interested in fused glass as well, this is a great way to um, kind of just get your foot in the door on that. And it's um, nice because you will ha we'll have a teacher who's coming to show us and we're gonna do it with all the other ladies and we're just gonna have a really great time. So block out your calendar for May 18th from nine to seven um, and plan to be there the whole day. Don't let anything distract you from this. If God is telling you that this is something that you can do, which we hope it is, then um, make sure to prioritize the whole day as you can. We'd love to see you there. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. So ladies, etch that into your schedule. Don't let it sneak away from you. Youth group is off for the summer, so enjoy that little extra time off, kiddos. I think uh, some are taking SAT tests real soon, or maybe even today. Um, pray for them. Ladies are doing their ladies' Bible study. Is it less than 20 this week? I thought it was, okay, less than 20 this week. I thought we were on 19, or you were on 19. What would I know? So uh, that's here at the church on Tuesday, 9.30 to 11.30. Dan's words of encouragement are on Tuesday as well at 5 and 7.30. You can join them. Join them live. Watch them afterwards. Stay caught up. Great, great little tidbits of encouragement that he puts into our hands every week. So keep watching those. Wednesday, it's Men's Bible Study, Chapter 7 this week. Jacob offers blessings, and it's the second portion of Chapter 7. <clears throat> so keep coming, guys. New study starting soon for the guys. So talk to Dan about getting your materials for that if you need to. We talked about the Ladies' Day Out. Um, it talks about the new study starting on April 24th. If you haven't been a part of the study coming up to this point, great time for you to get into the study with some new, some new things. If you've been in the study, come on out for another, uh, for another round. It's always good stuff. We have a fair amount of things in the Save the Dates, although some of them are pushing out a little bit far. Uh, you can see them all in here. Our uh, <clears throat> Vacation Bible School is is geared in and signed uh, so July 22nd to the 25th we always need a lot of helping hands for that so as many adults and kids that can come and help with that uh, be prepared uh, Coral will have a sign-up sheet for that soon the ladies day out has a sign-up sheet out there now and active so sign up for that as well ladies if you've got Bible questions as you're reading through the Bible if you hear somebody say something about a verse and it makes you wonder and have to dig deeper, write it down on a piece of paper. We have the paper out on the foyer table. Drop it into the offering boxes. Dan unfolds those answers to the questions for us. 
and oftentimes more than just the person asking the questions is blessed by those answers. So keep writing those questions down. With that, we'll dismiss the kids for Sunday school and be back for Dan's message. Thanks.
We could find our seats. Those of you that are out in the foyer still, please come in. Is there anybody out there, John? Crack the whip. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to say for the guys, uh, this coming Wednesday is our last study with Jacob. We've been studying through the life of Jacob. So this coming Wednesday is the last Sunday or the last Wednesday for that. The next character that we're going to study is Joseph. And we're not going to wait around, we're just going to get right into it. So it'll be the following week. So if you haven't yet got your book, those that are regularly participating already, that's, there it is. You can, it's, the name of it is in the bulletin. So the name, author, you can get them from Amazon and probably from Christian book distributors and other places. So he's willing to sell them to you for... A reasonable <laughs> just, just a small 50% markup. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, and we've, uh, we've done, I think our Abraham book was by this fella, and we had a great time with that. So uh, go ahead and get that, buy it, and come ready to study starting... Wednesday after this coming. Okay, so let's uh, turn in our Bibles this morning to uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. That's we're going to be our scripture reading this morning, Mark chapter 9. And we're going to read from verses 42 to 48. So let's stand. I'll read the first and the even-numbered verses, and you guys can read the odd-numbered verses as we read what Jesus has to say about the future. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, block it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. What happened to verse 45? We missed it, huh? We got verse 45 there, Dave? There it is. That's your verse 2. Go ahead. Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life rain than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Verse 46, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And I think you already read verse 47. And verse 48 is the same as the one that I just read. So let's pray. Father, as we talk about this this subject of hell this morning, I pray that your spirit would be here, that your spirit would open up our eyes, enlighten us, to the truth that is here, and uh, that we would be educated, and when we're done, we'll be more understanding of this doctrine of hell, the certainty of hell, uh, and and that we'll be able to better communicate with others um, what it's all about. And so, thank you, Lord, for that. And at the same time, we thank you for your mercy and grace, because as we submit our lives to Jesus Christ, 
uh, and confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. You make it so that we don't have to even worry about it. We're going to be in heaven with you forever. Bless now this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. It's not a, it's not a, a subject that a lot of people like to talk about. Uh, some Christians just kind of want to stay away from it because uh, they're afraid that they're going to offend whoever it is that they talk with about it. But it's something that needs to be talked about because it's talked about in the Bible. And if we ignore it, then we're being dishonest uh, about what the Bible teaches. Some, sometimes people portray hell as sort of a party zone. You know, when I die, more than one person has said, I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends will be. We're going to have a party. But if that person knew what Scripture says about hell and believed it, uh, he or she would think twice about that. Hell is a place of eternal separation from God. It's a place of great suffering and the ultimate judgment on a life that is spent in rebellion against God. Sadly, there are a lot of people, even some evangelical Christians, who shy away from acknowledging the reality of hell. Yet it is often mentioned in the Bible, and Jesus often spoke about hell. Hell is real, and Christians are remiss if they, if they don't recognize that. In the world, hell is a source of significant controversy. Many parts of Western culture have, in a sense, done away with hell. It's a scary concept, and it's difficult to think that a loving God would do something as awful as send somebody to a place of as terrible as we imagine hell to be. Therefore, many people cover up the idea of hell, and they seek to make it less of a bad place. Or they say that there is no such place. Others say that hell is just a, a place of purification where a person is cleansed and then after the cleansing they're released into heaven. But what does Jesus say? Luke 12, 5, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. One time a TV talk show host, uh, who most of you probably know, said, God is love, and the God that I believe in would never send somebody to hell. And the audience, of course, plotted enthusiastically as, she passionately stated her position about the afterlife. And a panel of guests had been assembled to explain various views about death and heaven and hell and, and God's judgment. And of those, those authors and those scholars, only one individual, only one, an evangelical minister defended the biblical teaching about hell. And as the program progressed, both audience and interviewer seemed increasingly hostile to that lone evangelical panelist. Surveys show that in the West, belief in a literal hell is at an all-time low, and its most vocal opponents sometimes include the clergy. In a world of psychic hotlines and horoscopes and Wicca and alternative spirituality, Christians must be able to share and defend their beliefs effectively. They must proclaim clearly and consistently, gently and lovingly, the possibility of heaven along with the warnings of hell. Hell is not a topic to be ignored. Hell is a real place where those who don't turn to Christ as their Savior and Lord will go, where they will be separated forever from God. The task of believers is to tell people 
the truth, even when it's not pleasant, in the hopes of preventing them from going to hell. Although hell may be offensive to talk about, it is a real place and a fact that cannot be ignored. Jonathan Edwards was a fiery preacher who played a key role in America's first great awakening, which was a spiritual revival that swept the country in the mid-1700s. And I want to share with you just a portion of what is perhaps his most famous sermon, which he titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Edwards said this, quote, So that whatever some have imagined and pretended about promises made to natural men's earnest seeking and knocking, it is plain and manifest that whatever pains a natural man takes in religion, whatever prayers he makes, till he believes in Christ, God is under no manner of obligation to keep him a moment from eternal destruction. So that thus it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those that are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of his wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire bent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out and they have no interest in any mediator. There are no means within reach that can be any security to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. Now, <laughs> Those are, those are intense words, wouldn't you say? And when I, I, I read that when um, Jonathan Edwards preached that, he had it in a written manuscript and he just read it to his congregation. He wasn't in, you know, expressive. He wasn't, you know, trying to be a hellfire and brimstone kind of a preacher. Um, he was just sharing the word, sort of in a monotone, uh, sort of delivery. And while he was doing so, people were weeping and getting down on their knees because they were so convicted by the Spirit of God. So for our study today, I'd like us to consider three things. First, we'll talk about some of the objections to the existence of hell. So that when they're put in front of you, you might uh, you know, have a means of answering them. And then we're going to talk about the reality of hell. And then we're going to consider what the implications would be if there were no hell. And that'll be sort of an eye-opener for you. So first, what are some of the objections to the existence of hell? Well, for the unbeliever, the main objection that they have against hell is that they say that it simply doesn't exist. That's it. They just don't believe it's real. Um, they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in the authority of Scripture. And so not believing in hell is rather natural for them. It's not a problem. Now, believers who deny the existence of hell hold several views. Some of them believe in what is called annihilationism. They believe that hell is real and that those who go there don't come back, but they believe that at death people are annihilated. They cease to exist. Those who hold this view misinterpret Matthew 5.22, which says, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. 
And whosoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And the word used here for hell or hellfire is the word Gehenna, which comes from the Greek Gina, which is a Greek form of the Hebrew words that are used to speak of uh, an actual place in Jerusalem called the Valley of Hinnom. The valley, uh, this valley of Hinnom ran outside the walls of Jerusalem, and it was used in the Old Testament times for human sacrifices to the pagan god Molech. King Josiah put a stop to these human sacrifices, 2 Kings 23.10, and then the valley of Hinnom came to be used as a place where human waste and rubbish were disposed of and burned. And so it was, in effect, a giant trash dump. The fire of Gehenna never went out. So it came to be used symbolically as the place of divine punishment. Annihilationists focus on the idea that what goes there is burned up. And that's true for the Valley of Hinnom, but not for hell. The point that Jesus was making here and in other verses is not that things eventually burn up, but that the fire never stops. In a place where things burn up, the fire will eventually stop when there's no more fuel, right? But where the thing in the fire doesn't burn up, the fire can then continue. In short, Jesus used the idea of Gehenna as an image so that his audience could sense the reality of hell. Annihilationists also cite um, Matthew 5, 29 to 30. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out, uh, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you than one of your members perish, uh, than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And so they consider the whole body going to hell to mean a complete loss of one's person or identity. They view it as a complete destruction of a person's body and soul. But the verse doesn't really say anything about the destruction of the body at all, only that the body will be in hell. Some annihilationists also cite our passage today from Mark 9, 47 to 48. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into fire. Verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. They say that the worm and the unquenchable, unquenchable fire will destroy until nothing remains. But that's illogical, again, because a fire that destroys until nothing is left is a fire that goes out. It's quenched. If everything is burned, there would be no more fire. It can't be both destroyed and then go on forever. The two ideas are in conflict. So, so these are the uh, annihilationists. Um, another belief that denies the reality of hell is called Universalism, the belief that eventually everyone will be saved. Universalists believe that no matter how bad a person has been, he will eventually be united with God in heaven. And there are several different forms of universalism. A fairly prominent Christian version says that hell is simply a way station for purification where those who don't come to faith on earth will be then purified in hell and then released to heaven. We mentioned that before. How this purification actually takes place, we don't know. How a guy like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin gets purified is hard to explain, but they believe that it happens. Then there are others who think that there is no such place as hell because God couldn't send people to such a terrible place. It's kind of like the talk show host um, that we mentioned earlier. 
Most universalists agree that the Bible nowhere teaches their particular view that God won't send people to hell. They just don't believe it. They, they, they continue to be universalists out of a desire that they have that no one should go to hell. And yet their love is not really a pure form of love because it lacks something very essential to love, and that is justice. The fact that a person doesn't want to accept something doesn't make it untrue. Universalism is very popular, though, because it is in some ways politically correct. It is viewed as nice because it doesn't hurt anyone's feelings. However, they fail to take into account the feelings of the victims of these monsters and their families. And it, and it is supposedly tolerant. Universalism allows people to get away with doing as they please and not having to face the consequences. These people are not really living in reality. Sounds like many of the major metropolitan cities in the U.S. today, doesn't it? Those who have elected these um, district attorneys that refuse to, to prosecute many, many, many different crimes. Hell is real. Hell is real because God is both good and just. And if they don't face that fact, they are either themselves on their way to hell or they're allowing others to go there because they don't want to seem to be forcing religion down somebody else's throat. Universalists don't hold to a proper view of salvation because if everyone can be saved then what was the point of Jesus dying on the cross? If they're going to automatically be saved in the end, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Others object to the notion of eternal conscious torment. They say the concept of eternal conscious torment is just intolerable. Jesus, however, did not find the idea of everlasting punishment intolerable. Instead, he seemed to have it on his mind often, and he saw no conflict with a loving God and eternal punishment. One thing many Christian universalists don't point out is that universalism almost always leads to moral relativism. Getting rid of everlasting justice leads to today's idea of tolerance and acceptance. You can't be for both justice and universalism because universalism is completely contrary to justice. If everybody's going to be saved in the end, then there is no reason for us to you know, be nice people today or to you know, avoid sin or to avoid hurting other people. It makes morality a joke. And yet another belief that denies the existence of hell is the view that hell is the greatest of all evils. It's the greatest of all evils. How could God, who is all loving, send people to a place like hell? Well, the answer is ultimately in the comparison, again, of justice and love seen most clearly at the cross. How can God be both loving and and forgiving, and yet just, and punish sin? Well, the answer is Jesus. He sent his son to pay the price of sin so that justice would be served and so that people can receive forgiveness. To be just, God must punish sin. He cannot let evil reign. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So those who sin must pay the price, which is death. Death here is referring to hell. This is not just a physical death. It's a spiritual death. Those who do not choose Christ are separated from him and everyone for all eternity. But his love is also seen in that he doesn't annihilate those who don't choose him because that would go against his nature. 
He allows the one who does not choose him to have what he or she really wanted. And that is separation from him in eternity. They did not desire his presence. And so he allows them to be eternally removed from him. You see, if all evils were removed from the universe, we wouldn't know the good. Because the good is only known by comparing it to what is evil. Just like health, health is most appreciated by those who have lost it. Right? The reality of hell is intimately tied to the person and work of Jesus. If there is no hell, then one's understanding of who Jesus is and what he did really has to be thoroughly revised. In other words, removing hell is is not like removing one stone from a pile and leaving all of the others untouched. It's like removing a vital organ from a body because it gives us pain. But once you remove it, all the others are affected and eventually killed. Hell is is not the greatest of all evils. It's actually an eternal deterrent that will effectively discourage evil um, in this present life. Annihilationism doesn't do that, nor does universalism. Neither one discourages evil in this present life, nor does the belief that hell doesn't exist discourage evil. Okay, so now let's talk about the reality of hell. Doubting hell because a person finds it difficult to believe would mean that people can change whatever they want about spiritual matters just because they don't like it, which is really the first step toward um, relativism. You see, God created mankind for the best of all worlds. He has given people the ability to have free choice. They can decide what to do. He does not make them do what is right. People have a choice. And an understanding of free will leads one to view hell as an essential Christian doctrine. God will triumph over evil when it's the perfect time. As Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Love is the greatest good, but love is impossible without free choice. One doesn't truly love someone if that person is forced to love him. Forced love is not love. It's actually a contradiction. God wants people to know the greatest and only kind of love through free choice. He gave this to mankind even though he knew that some people would choose to do the opposite of good and bring evil into the world. Now, instead of destroying humanity to get rid of evil, because that's what he would have to do, God decided to give people the greatest choice and the greatest good of all. This is what some call the crucial answer to the problem of evil because it is the crux of the matter. The English term crucial derives from the Latin crux, which originally meant cross. In the end, the cross of Christ serves as the divine answer, the ultimate divine answer to the problem of evil. Yes, evil men took the life of the innocent Son of God. But at the same time, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is God's ultimate act of goodness and power. There the Father sacrificed his Son, according to John 3.16, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And the righteous Son himself exercised his own free will by giving up his life so that people can be reconciled to God, Romans 5.8 and 2 Corinthians 5.21. Yes, 
Evil is very much present in God's world, but it's not going to always be present. It is not going to prevail in the end. God has given us the answer to the problem of evil. There was no problem of evil until mankind brought it into the world through a choice to do what was not good. All one need do to get the answer to the problem of evil is to look at the cross and remember that God has already provided the greatest good. And if a person accepts that, then one day he'll be in paradise with him and evil will be completely defeated. Again, the crucifixion of Christ was both the greatest evil committed by men and at the same time the greatest good, the greatest gift that God could give to mankind. The tension between God accomplishing his plan and the allowing of human freedom displayed in, in the cross is a mystery. And to tamper with either aspect, I think, produces terrible results. To deny human responsibility transforms the perpetrators into God's servants who do good when they crucify the Son of God. To minimize God's involvement transforms the cross into something that God is just making do with. Both approaches are wrong in the extreme. Without a doubt, the cross is both God's will without tarnishing him with evil and the guilty deeds of evildoers without making them puppets whose strings are pulled by God. Now here's another thought. An eternal realm without hell creates its own problems. Heaven then becomes the only place where people go at death. But heaven isn't just a place of eternal bliss. It's the place where everyone will spend eternity in one form or another worshiping God in his presence. Why then would anyone want to spend an eternity in the presence of God worshiping him if he wanted nothing to do with God during his life on the earth. You see, heaven loses some of its attributes if hell doesn't exist. Without hell, there can be no free will. There's no choice if there's no hell. There is no ultimate justice if there is no hell. If Adolf Hitler has just as much right to heaven as Billy Graham, then there is no justice. And God is not good. This also, again, leads to moral relativism. If there is no hell, there is no difference between good and evil. If there is no hell, then Jesus isn't who he claims to be because people wouldn't need a savior. There is no reason for faith if there is no hell. Christ's death was a mistake and a waste. Ah, but the Bible teaches that both heaven and hell are very real places and that each person will eventually spend eternity in one of those places. Most of what is known about hell is straight from Jesus' own mouth. Matthew 18, 8-9, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. We read those verses. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out cast it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So hell, according to Jesus, is everlasting fire. Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So again, hell is not just everlasting fire, it's everlasting punishment according to Jesus. John 5, 28, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, Jesus says. So hell is a place of condemnation. 
Over and over again, Scripture describes hell as a place of punishment. You can see several verses there. Jesus also described it several times as a place of outer darkness in Matthew 8, verse 12. The punishment is just because it's deserved. Those in hell are in an inescapable, indescribable torment. It's also conscious punishment, and it's everlasting. A person cannot escape hell. If you go back and you read uh, the story of Lazarus and the rich man, and it's in Luke, I think it's 16, right around there. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a description of what it's like in hell, what everlasting torment is like. A person cannot escape. He, he would like to, but there's a chasm that exists between him and heaven, and he can't leave. Uh, once there, he's always going to be there. He's conscious. Um, He's, he's in torment. Another key emphasis in the Bible's description of hell is that of destruction. Now again, this has led some to conclude that the Bible teaches annihilationism, but the idea of destruction in hell doesn't mean extinction. The words used refer to a thing that has lost its nature. It can never do what it was made to do. People were made to love God and to worship him, but because they decide to deny God forever, those in hell cannot fulfill their purpose any longer. That is what destruction in this sense means. Banishment is the other key emphasis on hell. Those in hell are banished from heaven and from God from anything good. This is the final everlasting separation that's described in Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, but outsider dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. This, folks, is the reality and the certainty of hell. Now, what are some other implications if there is no hell? If a person believes there is no hell, then he must question all of the other doctrines of the church and the inerrancy of Scripture. One cannot hold to Christianity and throw hell out the window. Also, if hell is denied, then Christ's authority is in question because he taught the existence of hell. C.S. Lewis comments on the reality, the characteristics, and the rationality of hell in his book, The Problem of Pain. He says, some will not be redeemed. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this. If it lay in my power, he says, he's talking about hell. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. He says, The characteristic of lost souls is their rejection of everything that is not simply themselves. He has his last wish, to live wholly in the self and to make the best of what he finds there. And what he finds there is hell. In other words, that's what selfishness brings you. You want to live in yourself all the time? Okay, you're, you're, you, you can do that. But what you're going to find there in your selfishness, is hell. In the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out all their past sins and at all costs to give them a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty and offering every miraculous help? But he has done so already at Calvary. Lewis also said of hell, the door of hell is locked on the inside. He says, you can go in if you want, but once you go in, you're locked in. He also said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done, and that are in hell, choose it. In other words, God allows people to choose not to be in his presence. 
By choosing to abandon God, people are choosing hell. That is an important point. Again, Lewis goes on to say, I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully, all will be saved. But my reason retorts, without their will or with it? If I say without their will, I at once perceive a contradiction. How can the supreme voluntary act of self-surrender be involuntary? If I say with their will, my reason replies, how if they will not give in? You see, God can forgive sin, but he can't condone it. To condone an evil is simply to ignore it, to treat it as if it were good. If it's God setting aside the evil without the evil doer repenting of it, God can't do this because he's holy, and yet this is what people want God to do to a degree. They want him to condone their sins, but they don't want him to condone the sins of Hitler or Stalin or a terrorist or a murderer or a rapist. Indeed, he cannot. But what about forgiveness? Can God forgive sins without condoning them? Yes, he can, but not without condition. You see, forgiveness needs to be accepted as well as offered if it's to be complete. And a man who admits no guilt can accept no forgiveness. The burden of acceptance of forgiveness remains with the sinner. One must accept the consequences of having free will, including his sins. Because of sin, a person must accept Christ, who was the answer to sin. But those who won't do that must accept then the consequences of their sin. God would be unjust if he allowed them to escape the consequences of their actions, their desire to be free from him. Sin is present. Hell is real. And humans choose them, both in lieu of a God who loves us and wants an eternal loving relationship with us. People aren't free to reinvent or to revise or to change biblical truths and Christian doctrines just because they don't like them. Truth must be evaluated based on God's word. God's loving offers, God lovingly, that is, offers forgiveness. He lovingly offers it to anyone, but it must be accepted. It cannot be forced. Accepting the reality of hell does not make God vengeful or hateful. He is characterized by love and mercy, but he's also characterized by justice and righteousness. For God to be loving and good, he must also be just and righteous. You can't have a loving and good God without a just and a righteous God. A loving and good God would never allow evil to go unpunished. It would be unjust for him to do so. So for him to be good and just, he must punish evil. The truth is that hell is necessary because God's holy and just nature demands that evil be punished. Similarly, the cross was necessary because God's merciful nature demanded that salvation be offered. And since everyone falls short of God's standard, According to Romans 3.23, they all deserve hell. Three points should be noted, I think, in this connection. First, God is good. God is good. He's righteous. That means he's righteous. That means he's gracious. He's merciful. Second, man is free. That means he's informed. He's volitional. He's fallen. And then third, because of that, because God is good and man is free, therefore, judgment is fair. It's fair. Let me summarize by restating some of the things that we've just talked about. 
First, hell is a teaching essential to Christian doctrine. That's why we're covering it in this series that we're calling Doctrine That Deepens Faith. It's essential to Christian doctrine. In fact, it's essential to a good and to a just universe. Scripture paints a picture of what hell is like, and more importantly, that hell is real. Second, take away hell, and you wind up with humans who have no free will. We would not have a choice about the afterlife. Heaven would be our only option if there's no hell. Third, there is no contradiction between a loving God and the reality of hell. The Bible presents both. Though they may seem incompatible to our fallen natures, simple logic tells us that for God to be good, he must judge wickedness. And then fourth, God does not actually send people to hell in any sort of an arbitrary way. People choose to abandon God, and he allows it. God does not force people to worship him or to experience the joy of his presence. Folks, at the final judgment, one thing will be patently clear. God is fair, and God is merciful and just. What is actually hard to understand is the fact that anyone will be in heaven. That's the really hard thing to understand, that anyone will be in heaven. The opportunity to enter God's holy presence proves his mercy and his grace. Jonathan Edwards reflected on the uncomfortable truth of hell. He said, "'Tis dreadful, tis awful, but tis true." The Bible states that people love darkness rather than light, John 3, 19, and that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, John 14, 6. If you believe in the reality of hell, it actually shows that you think highly of Jesus. If you deny hell, then you think very lowly of Jesus. The wisdom of Charles Spurgeon comes from more than a century ago. He says, think lightly of hell and you will think lightly of the cross. Think a little of the sufferings of lost souls and you will soon think little of the Savior who delivers them. Those who fail to accept Christ's payment for their sins will go to hell. It's not politically correct these days to say that, but it's true nonetheless. Heaven and hell are very real places. Whether a person will be in heaven or hell after death will depend on whether he chooses to accept God's gift of salvation and follow Jesus. It's both our privilege and our duty to proclaim what God has clearly revealed. Hope is found in salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word once again. Sometimes the things that we read in your word are uh, a little inconvenient, to say the least. Um, they're a little hard for us to grasp. But we know that these things are true because, because your word declares them and Jesus affirmed them. And since we believe Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord... We have to come to grips even with the inconvenient things. And so I pray, Lord, that as we have gathered together to study your word and as we are surrendered and submitted to you, uh, that you help us, Lord, to grasp a hold of this, not just so that we can understand it ourselves, but so that we can um, share it with others when the opportunity arises. Share the truth that because God is loving and, and God is merciful and good and kind. He has to deal with this problem of evil in our world. He has to, he has to require justice and judgment for those who refuse to repent and to be willing to change. So, Lord, th this is a reasonable concept when we think about it in terms of... Uh, 
justice in our society. We, we want the criminal to uh, be stopped and we want him to have to face judgment. We're willing to extend mercy where, where mercy is necessary. But um, the price has to be paid for the crimes that are committed. That's, that's the reality. It's the reality of our world, and it's definitely the reality of the eternal kingdom. So help us, Lord, to be able to understand it and to be able to communicate it when we have the opportunity. And help us to accept it in our own lives. We, we come to you now, Lord, realizing that salvation is a gift and that it's because of your mercy and grace that it's even possible that we all deserve judgment because of our actions, because of our, our rebellion against you, but that because you have dealt with the problem of evil at the cross, you allowed your son who... Uh, was not guilty in any way of evil. You allowed him to take our punishment uh, upon himself and that you will accept him as a substitute for us and you will allow us into heaven because of Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. And we pray that you'll help us to be purveyors of that truth to the dark world that is around us. Help us, Lord, to find those that are open to you. Help us, Lord, to, to uh, seek those opportunities to share the truth. And uh, help us to be bold as we do so. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody agreed saying, Amen. Amen. Um, you know what, I want to I ask you this morning, if you, if you need prayer for anything this morning, uh, you're going through a difficult time. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's with a friend or a family member. Uh, something else is, is, is bothering you, some situation that you are facing. Maybe you need a touch in your body. Uh, you're struggling physically, and you want prayer uh, this morning before you leave. I want to ask you, as we sing this last song, would you just get up out of your seat and come and sit here in the front row. If you want prayer for whatever it is, come up in the front row and uh, one of the elders uh, or myself will be here to pray for you after we dismiss, okay? So just get up as we're singing, come to the front, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you at the, at the end of the service, okay? And we can pray for you. All right? Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> stand and sing with us. There'll be some background vocals you'll hear behind you. Don't be alarmed. You might start bouncing in the, in the aisles as well. <laughs> it's a little bit of a new song, but it's the Lord's Prayer, so it's not new. Let your will be done I'm held as in heaven Right here in my heart Father, let your kingdom come Father, let your will be done I'm held as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day our daily bread Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father. Let your kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done. Honor as in heaven.
ones who sin against us, forgive them, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours. It's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours. So if you hear that, uh, those, those w ladies that are singing in the, in the back, they kind of do the echo thing. I want you guys to do that next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do this song again next week, right? Yes. And the other new one that you, that you introduced to us. Welcome Holy Spirit. Welcome, huh? Holy. Welcome Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's it. Welcome Holy Spirit. Okay, well... Nobody needs prayer. I guess everybody's just fine. Everything is peachy, creamy, no issues, no problems. I know my friend Cliff there needs a little prayer. He's going to have a root canal on Tuesday done. Have you, how many have had a root canal? How many of you are just anxious to go back and have it done again? But listen, I was telling, I was telling Cliff, I had, I've had one root canal, and I was told you know, all these uh, crazy stories about root canals. And you know, when I went, it was a piece of cake. I mean, it was no different than getting a filling. So I'm praying that for you, brother. Let's, let's, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> let's lay hands. You guys just lay hands on, on Cliff right now, if you will, those that are around him. And we're going to pray for him. Lord, we lift up Cliff to you right now. And we just ask, Lord, first of all, that you'll comfort his heart, that you'll help him to trust in you, and realize that uh, this is going to be a good thing in the long run. It's going to be a good thing for him. But I pray that uh, you'll give uh, wisdom to the dentist. I pray that you'll just give him a, a, just a, a boatload of gentleness as he uh, does this root canal and, and helps to relieve Cliff of the, the pain that he has because he needs it. And I, I pray that uh, it'll just go well that there'll be no issues, that there'll be no problems, and that he'll emerge from it feeling a lot better and knowing that it's, it's taken care of. So just comfort him right now. Be with Linda as well. Help her to be a blessing to her husband. In Jesus' name. Everybody agreed saying amen. God bless you all. Have a good, uh, have a good week, and we'll see you soon.